guys, welcome back. And as promised before the break, we're going to have a conversation about comprehensive sexuality education in Belize's secondary schools. And joining us for this conversation, we have program coordinator for Go Belize, Elmer Cornejo, and we also have uh, Go Hoven alumni and now a social worker for the Community Rehabilitation Department, Kyla Siego. Good morning and welcome. welcome to the show. Morning, guys. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Now, let's start off by talking a little bit about Go Belize and the program and what uh, its stated objectives are. Right, well, Go Belize was formed essentially from an prog original program called Go Hoven. And Go Hoven is a leadership program uh, in youth leadership and sexual and reproductive health for young people in the region. Of, and it included Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, and Belize. In 2009, the program saw the, um, the barrier of the English language because we were Belizeans and our first language is English. We couldn't speak uh, Spanish well. So in 2009, we broke away and we formed our own Go Hoven Belize program. In 2011, the alumni who graduated from the Gohoven Regional Program decided, you know what, we don't want us to die here. We need to do this for Belize. So then we formed our own NGO in March of 2011. And our objectives, our mission is to keep environmental consciousness at the forefront in Belize and also the, to keep um, sexual and reproductive health issues of young people in the forefront here in Belize as well. And so all our programs and projects that we do are built around those. Now, you talk about the engagement of young people and it was more regional um, outreach. Yeah. Uh, how, how was that embraced by Belizeans in general? What kind of uh, numbers were you looking in terms of your uh, participation? And who stayed the course to become alumni? Well, it went through an entire process. So the process was you send in your application for the program. It was advertised on the radio, on the TV. Um, and so if you were interested, you would send in your application. If your application was successful, you would be called for an interview. And if you passed the interview, then you would get a date to begin the program, the training, because there are four week trainings. And so if you are accepted, you will know when the first training will begin. Okay. Um, and so it, it was like every year we would do a cohort. Uh, in terms of the regional program, it, it was six persons. So six Belizeans would go across the different parts of the region and do these trainings, intensive trainings. And, um, you know, after that you come back home and you implement a leadership yeah, action plan um, that would cater around a burning issue in your community. So you would deal with that as a young as a young leader now who already now have the tools to do so. Yeah. Now I, I want to start off uh, just to find out, Kyla, um, what prompted you to sign up to be a part of Gohoven? Well, um, what happened um, as a young person, I felt that I was um, invincible, right? <laughs> so I had certain, let's say, sexual practices that weren't. Um, as responsible as they should be. <laughs> and I, at age 19, I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing my bachelor's degree at the time, so I was, I was okay. My family, very supportive. Um, but that's when I realized that I need to be more concerned about my sexual health. And um, I met a past fellow of Go Hoven program, and she encouraged me to apply. So in 2010, in 2011, 2012, sorry, I applied, I got accepted, and it was such an amazing program. It's not just about sexual health, but it's about youth leadership, it's personal development, it's even professional development. It helps in terms of networking, working with other young people. And I come from Dangriga, mm -hmm. and so we have certain um, practices with our young people and, and we've had, um, at one point, Stankrick District, highest HIV infection, and so a lot of other social ills. And so I was motivated to want to encourage other young people to take their sexual and productive health seriously. Yeah. So what did you do on your return for your community? So me and my team, it was four of us. We had a project in Dangriga, and it was focused on two things to increase the awareness of 100 young people on sexual and reproductive health and to increase access to the services 
provided by the SRH um, agencies. Mm -hmm. So for a year and a half, we did help fairs, we did um, training sessions with young people. We even started a core volunteer group that helped us to teach other young people. Yeah. We went into schools mm -hmm. doing sessions and so um, we worked with the polyclinic with, and with BFLA in terms of encouraging young people to go and access the services, to use the contraceptives that's there and mainly to educate them about sexual health and how important it is. So now, some of the things that you're saying, um, it has been a challenge in terms of ha having an open conversation mm -hmm. in the public. Uh, primarily because there are uh, sectors within our society that, beca that become concerned when you start talking about sexual and reproductive health rights mm -hmm. or sexuality yeah. education yeah. Um, uh, for various reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. The first concern is that you are telling young people to go out and have sex and use protection um, and stay safe. Mm -hmm. How do you break past those barriers? How do you teach your young people to break past those barriers when they go out to be able to educate young people? I think that to answer your question, I would have to say that I am a human being mm -hmm. and I am a young person. Mm -hmm. And you are a human being and you are an adult person. Mm -hmm. And both of us make choices. And you've had an experience You've had stories to tell, and I'm sure you've seen a lot that have been going on since you were a young person. A lot of those things implies that you've seen domestic violence, you've seen gender-based violence, you've seen teenage pregnancies, you've known or heard about HIV incidences. So are you being selfish enough to not want me to not get into that? I must be empowered as a young person to not make or to not find myself in situations like these. And yes, when we talk about sex education, or when we say even the word sex, it mm -hmm. becomes so, like if you're cursing you know, to other yeah. people, like it hurts your ears to just hear the word sex. And mm -hmm. we can't continue to feed society with this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of behavior, because yeah. we should be talking about it. So what, how do you engage? I think that's the, the thing that Marlene was getting at how do you engage people from all different demographics, generational divides, to actually have a sensible, salient, sober conversation? Well, in terms sex. of the Gohoven program, the Gohoven program seeks first to engulf and understand each person that makes up the team of cohort. So then, after that, you become a family basically, and you understand your partner and you understand your colleague. So then what you say and, and, and do, we're confident enough that we're going to share your experience and we're going to find a solution to it, to it if, we are, if we can, if we have the capacity mm -hmm. to do so. And then afterwards you get the training, you get the training in communications, you get the training in public, public speaking, mm -hmm. you get the training in leadership skills. All those molded together then makes a pavement to be um, capable of understanding the implications of talking about sex education, the, implica the implications about knowing what sexual and reproductive health um, is about. So then it lays off uh, an, a balanced atmosphere for this kind of conversation. How many alumni do you have currently? Since 2003, yeah. we've had um, a cohort per year, okay. with the exception of 2010. And how do you uh, support the alumni once they come back from training? Have they been taught how to manage their own programs uh, that they will lead in their, in their communities? And how do you keep uh, the, the association of, of alumni together? Well, in terms of um, the program, throughout your four, four weeks of training, mm -hmm. you are taught how to um, write proposals, you are taught how to do your project, how to monitor and evaluate. And so you're given the tools that you need to run your program. Yeah. And while you're out there in your community doing your activities and so forth, you still have the, um, the team itself, the trainers mm -hmm. um, from Go Belize who come and they check on you. They hear what your concerns are. They help you to go through if um, you're having any issues with your program or your activities. So there's a lot of support there. And from time to time, there are other trainings where other fellows are pulled in and it's a refresher, or you're learning something new. And so there is always that support. I mean, Elmer is just an email away. 
<laughs> and, and that's how it is with us, with the Gobelese family. What are some of the common challenges you find yourself addressing uh, with the young people when they're implementing their programs? I think communication is one of the, the challenges that mm -hmm. we've encountered. And basically because everybody, you see, the good thing about mm -hmm. Gobelese is that we belong to different sectors of community. So while Kyla is a social worker, I, I work at the organization as the project coordinator, but my other partner who is still in my team, he's a nurse. You know, so the jobs that we have doesn't allow us to communicate um, as much as we would want or to meet as much as we would want. But when yeah. we meet, then we do the work and we get it done. Mm -hmm. So is it where you continue to network yes. across yeah. cohorts yeah. or is right. it uh, more along your cohort and then you kind of figure out what people want to do in their particular community and then you give support? The only requirement to complete to, to say that you're an alumni of the, uh, of the program is that you implement an action plan. Mm -hmm. Once that has happened, it means that you are now an alumni. After that, you don't come back to a training because you don't belong to a cohort. You are a graduate of the program. But what happens, the beauty of it is that you remain as an alumni of the association. After that then, then you begin to get opportunities to mm -hmm. go out of the country and re represent young people in different platforms, conferences, and meetings. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you get to work with, with um, you get to help your colleagues in their work mm -hmm. as well. So if you work in the Ministry of Health and you're having health care, I can do the, the logistics for you, yeah. get it done. Yeah. So then we do a teamwork, basically. So the networking continues even after your court work what year is finished. Yeah. Right. Now, let's jump into the substantive conversation mm -hmm. about uh, comprehensive sexuality education in Belize, especially at the secondary level. Mm -hmm. What has been uh, the main intervention that Go Belize has done in terms of trying to spark that conversation, given the, the different layers that we know mm -hmm. are perhaps barriers to even engaging people along those lines. Right. Um, in 2013, we at Gobelies saw it necessary. Can I, can I just jump in one second? Right. Define, first of all, what is comprehensive sexuality yeah. education? Yeah. Perhaps we need to start there. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Well, this is how I want to, to answer you. How many fingers do you have? I hope 10. Marlene, <laughs> ten. how many fingers do you have? 10 for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you say 10, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see. So you have 10 fingers. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and 5. Mm -hmm. Isn't that 11? No. Where am I going? When we talk about things like these, comprehensive sexuality education, people, mm -hmm. a lot of the conservative people would make us believe what is not there. That is their job. But comprehensive sexuality education is, is defined. It has no other meaning. And when you go to, when I we visit the sexual health, the sexual and uh, reproductive. reproductive health bill of 2012, there is a clear definition about comprehensive sexuality education. And I don't want to use my words, but use the, the words, words in the bill. bill. So maybe you can share that. Mm -hmm. So according to the Sexual and Reproductive Health Bill, it says that comprehensive sexuality education. The term comprehensive sexuality education means helping young people to develop interpersonal skills necessary for the formation of caring, supportive, and non-coercive relationships and the ability to exercise responsibility regarding sexual relationships by addressing such issues as sexual diversity, abstinence, and the use of condoms, contraceptives, and other protective sexual health measures. Mm -hmm. And that so. is the definition that is from the Sexual and Reproductive Health Bill of Beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so, when I hear people trying to nag us because we want to talk about comprehensive sex ed in schools, I worry about them. I don't, I, I stop worrying about myself as a young person with all these issues, I worry about them because then I find that I have to teach you also about comprehensive sexuality education, even though you're a grown old man or a grown old lady. And uh, 
Now I have to weigh my balance. I have to teach young people and I also have to teach adults. And we try to do it in so the best way possible. how do you not put people on their heels? What do you mean? Get them to back up in term and put up a, def a defensive wall instead of opening up to have the conversation. And that is what we don't want. We don't want people to see us as a, as a barrier to, to, to reaching other people with sex ed information. Mm -hmm. Um, have you met we, buyers? We, we try you, when, to, when you try to go into schools or with young people, met. do people say, is, no, don't bring this information here? Yes, and that is, that is why we made a research to serve us as a baseline study to, to say this is why we need comprehensive sexuality education. We, started, we did this research in 2014 with the help of Ms. Florence Colson. Um, and when we went into the schools, that was precisely some of the questions we asked. Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing about comprehensive sex ed in your schools? And they would say like, oh no, like, you know, these, um, these things we don't talk to our students about. Mm -hmm. We teach them godly things and we teach them that you should abstain, you should practice abstinence until marriage. And these are the things that creates barriers, no? Yeah. And when we asked, have, you, have your school uh, experience have a situation around teenage pregnancy? They become yeah. Let me and eventually they share with us their ex their experiences. You know, like they would say, "Oh well, a few months ago we had this girl. She was pregnant and she had to be expelled of the school. She had to be withdrawn from the school." Mm -hmm. So these are the things that. Or we some find are out. allowed to go back, but mm -hmm. don't have supportive systems mm -hmm. enough to go back into school. Yeah. And I I, I want to ask that question uh, or something along those lines because. I hear what you're saying in, t in terms of taking in the information and getting it directly to young people. But do you also work on the advocacy level? For example, you have a bill. Um, what do you do to be able to encourage uh, policymakers or institutions to uh, take the, this issue more seriously? On the same point of accessing services, we were joined by uh, the Maternal and Health uh, Coordinator for the Ministry of Health. And one of the challenges they identified is, uh, obviously, we have an issue with teenage pregnancy, mm -hmm. but young girls can't access services mm -hmm. without parental consent. But the age mm -hmm. for sexual consent is 16. 16. Mm -hmm. So there are all these, uh, you know, it's in the law that the challenges are there. Mm -hmm. Do you work on advocacy to be able to get people to listen up mm -hmm. and say, you know what, we need to do something about this, and maybe it can start with the legal system? What is Advocacy works at different levels. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of in terms of Kobeles, we we work at the level of meeting with the different ministries okay. involved. So the Ministry of Human Development, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, and we've had quite a number of meetings mm -hmm. with them recently. Mm -hmm. Because I agree with you, our laws, uh, the laws of police, provide impediments, barriers for young people to access services. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clearly outlined in the law and so we have to work on that as well and it's but that would be a long-term thing you know yeah. at point in time right now we can't do that so what we want to do first is go one step at a time and that first step is to implement to 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 make the noise to to advocate for the implementation of CSE in schools okay and then on uh, on that same point uh kyla you shared obviously your personal experience mm -hmm. in terms of what prompted you to get involved with gohoven um what do you find is, is the information that young people, young girls, connect with the most? When you talk to them, you share your personal experience that you uh, got pregnant as a teen, um, and hopefully this type of information will help to mitigate that situation that we're seeing in our, in our communities. Well, um, in most of my work as a social worker, I've worked with young men, mm -hmm. and so I could speak from that aspect of them and sexual health education. Um, but a lot of my clients, when we talk about those things, the information that they get is from other friends or other maybe male family members, and it's not necessarily accurate information, as well as the attitude that they have towards sex. You know, so um, it is definitely a challenge in terms of working with our young people, but that's the reason why we need to grab them and we need to educate them properly. Comprehensive sexuality education is not just about giving you information, you know, 
but it's also about giving you the skills that you need how do we teach our young girls to negotiate and say no or how do we help explain them? that a little bit further because this is a crucial point and i've heard so many times in uh sexuality education mm -hmm. uh that it is a starting point and it's important young girls particularly uh need to learn to negotiate yeah. why yeah. negotiate what negotiate um their involvement if they want to get involved with sex and their mm -hmm. partner because you you will find or um it has come to my attention um to not me directly but to other persons that i've talked to who work with girls and female clients that they want to be pleasing mm -hmm. to their partner and so they do a lot of things or they engage in risky behavior and so it's important to teach them to negotiate sex because you want them to be empowered that they could say well we have to do this and you have to use a condom or we are not having sex at all because i am not ready and if he says well i'll leave you because you're not ready that she's strong enough to say well go you know that she's empowered enough to do that and even as um older women and um, people assume that young girls have the capacity that. to do that the, and they don't but necessarily that's not what we find on the that's ground. not what we find yeah. and that could easily transition into violence you know emotional abuse and so forth and comprehensive sexuality education also talks about gender-based violence right now there's the um be just on a side there's the ba1 project on prevention of violence against women mm -hmm. and it looks at human trafficking it looks at femicide and comprehensive sexuality is doing it from an earlier age within that adolescent age and teaching our young people about what it is to be in a healthy relationship how do we identify unhealthy relationships how do we look at things that could possibly become violent and protect ourselves so it's important negotiating um, what we do with our bodies, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think something also to add to that is that, because I've heard it a lot too, that people say, oh, well, only the older ones should know about it. But comprehensive sexuality can be taught at different age levels mm -hmm. because it should be age appropriate. Yeah. It should be inclusive from infant one from you start school all the way until you, you end up maybe even in university because we find, or we find present in time that um, even at the university, there are, there are 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 17 year olds who, not necessarily because they have become older in older in age, in, in age it, mm -hmm. it means that they know everything or know how to negotiate, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. And it implies and you the have same added for girls pressure and with for boys. Uh, drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And taking it back to what you spoke about in terms of the level of misinformation that you see. Uh, explain to me in, in your first encounter with young people, um, if you were to give us a percentage or a scale as to how many of them actually have the right information about their reproductive health um, and all that comes along with mm -hmm. it. Tell, tell me about that. What is the situation? There, that is, a cap, there is a CAP report that was um, released late last year from the National AIDS Commission. And that has very important information, um, rich information concerning what you're talking about. It is, it, I can't remember the exact numbers, yeah. but the percentages were, were high in terms of um, young people's education or literacy. Mm -hmm. it, it could it translate into, oh, young people know. Mm -hmm. But it was only talking about certain questions that were asked in the survey. Yeah. It does not necessarily, th it does not necessarily is saying that young people are well equipped enough to deal with, with sex. Yeah. So they, as you said, Kala, they get the information from friends, mm -hmm. which oftentimes is wrong information. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't find parents having that, that conversation, conversation with their child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So what are some of the misconceptions that you have heard in your practice? Oh, wow. Um, so I The have ones we can mention on television. Okay. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had clients who um, at some point throughout my work felt that you could not pregnant a girl the first time you had sex, um, that the chances of catching HIV are very, very slim, um, that um, sex is for pleasure and um, nothing is going to happen to you because you're young. Um, I'm too smart to catch HIV or, or to impregnate somebody that won't happen to me. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are some of the ideas that they have. Yeah. 
and it no. might sound like a lie but you know no. it's true they're real stories and mm -hmm. if you visit our facebook page it's www.facebook.com slash let's do it right please there is a video that unfpa did with mm -hmm. real stories of young people in belize mm -hmm. they're not lie stories they're not mm -hmm. makeup stories they're real stories because some of these girls got pregnant and they had to bear their child and you know it does, it does draw my attention to even want to work more about mm -hmm. around this, these issues. Now, going across the country, are there pockets of the nation where uh, there's more a liberal approach and areas where they're more conservative, where this is a no-no, definite no-no that you can even engage in the conversation? And are there other places where you have an openness to really have this discussion and have young people get the information that is necessary? Well, from my experience in my community, the young people that I worked with, they were very open um, and wanting to participate because the mode of how we gave the information, it was also through experiential learning. So they were doing activities while learning the information and drawing from their own experiences. Um, and in other areas, um, in terms of my work, I remember having, I won't say a big back and forth, but just having to kind of justify because I wanted the Department of Youth Services to come in to do sexual and productive health sessions. So I just kind of had to justify, okay, the need for this, why do I need to bring them into my institution with young people? Um, but I haven't really experienced closed Persons, I don't know what yeah. Elmer experienced. I, I, the, if you go down south, Punta Gorda is definitely one of the places where they're more close to even wanted, wanting to talk about teenage pregnancy, even though it's, hmm. it's, it's real there in the, in the communities, in, especially in the uh, Mayan communities. It's real, but they don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. in, in instances, we've had to tell the parents, okay, you can stay just so that we can start a conversation and then come back again next time. You know, make them feel okay. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Let they 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 can come again. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I the Corozal from where I come from. I think we've uh, we've moved a little from being too much of a conservative uh, population. I see more people opening to these kind of talks. Mm -hmm. But Punta Gorda, yes, definitely is one of the places where they're they're closed. Now, let, let's talk about some of the elements of the comprehensive sexual education. What all do you cover? So, comprehensive sexuality <coughs> education, it has seven components, and they include gender, um, sexual and reproductive health, and HIV, sexual and reproductive rights, um, pleasure, violence, diversity, and relationships. So those are the seven um, areas that make up comprehensive sexuality education. Yeah. yeah. What um, area do you find most people struggle with in terms of when you engage them in the conversation? I think when it comes to talking about sexuality, um, <laughs> in our trainings and um, in the sessions that we've had with young people, whenever we start to talk about sexuality and orientation and preference, that becomes very sticky. Um, and so for me, that has been like the most challenging area. Like we could talk about the, the reproductive organs. We could talk about sexual violence and all of those things. Um, but when we start to talk about orientation, that's when things start to get um, a bit sticky. And w what's your um, read on that? Why? Um, one, because of our cultural, our society being that we're religion based. So we believe in um, same-sex, I mean, in heterosexual relationships. And in terms of um, working with young people and trying to educate them on the different types of sexual orientation and just their whole perception towards it because they've been conditioned to think that anything other than heterosexual is wrong. Yeah. So. Hmm. And what is your, uh, how are you able to break through? Because you can't change people's mm -hmm. opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or views on, on particular issues, but you still want them to walk away with the information. Mm -hmm. How do you, what, what is your objective there? <laughs> so it's, it's to get them to not just think about themselves. What if one day we woke up in a world, and this is what I always tell my young people when we do sessions, right? I say, what if one day we woke up and it wasn't normal to be heterosexual? How would you feel? 
-hmm. And the response is like, hmm. And it's amazing when you start to get them to try and empathize, yeah. right? And to see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not about forcing you or imposing anything on you, but it's about just opening your mind and to educate you to see what the different other angles are. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to take that approach and, and um, getting them to empathize, and then they take a minute and they say, okay, hmm. And then and one open. more question views on abstinence what do you find when you go out to young people well because that's no. where the pressure is oftentimes mm -hmm. that we should be talking more to overcome these very same issues mm -hmm. and rightfully so abstinence would do so mm -hmm. we'd reduce stis and stds and, and hiv and teenage pregnancy what are the views when you reach out to young people on abstinence well the, the young people themselves say sorry about um yeah. You know, then the stories come out. And then we get to the point where the reality is that mm -hmm. abstinence only education is not working or is not enough. Mm -hmm. I totally agree that abstinence is one of the options, mm -hmm. but the world where I live in, as a young person, mm -hmm. I know it's not the only option. And I have to tell my young people okay. all their all options, the options because it's my duty as a Belizean, it's my duty as a citizen of this country to tell them. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you all populate um, in terms of reaching out to, to people? Do you go through schools? And how do you get that permission to enter in the first place? You know, somebody, when people get to know about Go Belize, they have a different perspective of our work that we do. When we tell them in reality, what is it that we do? Then they go, oh, I thought you were and so they themselves begin to call us. Um, can you come into my school on this date? We want to have a sex ed discussion. Can you um, come talk to, to our parents? We want to talk about this or that. So themselves, they, they call us. And, and I think we've, we've reached a, a level now where in Belize we have a good amount of people who know what Go Belize is and the work that we do. And our alumni mm -hmm. are, on, are across the country, so they can reach and to I, anywhere. And outside of going to school, um, Go Belize also does trainings in different areas for out of school youth. So that happens throughout the year as well, where they get to reach out to other young people and to educate them. Now, it's in, um, and I know we have to wrap, but um, reaching out of school youth, how is that different from those who are within the uh, formal school system? School system? Well, <laughs> um, I've never been responsible for recruiting, thank God. But I know that it's, it's a challenge because you have to go out and you have to find these young people. Or you have contacts in communities that have um, youth groups. And so you reach out to them and you kind of have to encourage them to want to hear or to want to participate in the trainings and the sessions that you have. And so you find that you will set a two-day training and you're targeting maybe 25 participants and you don't get to meet that whole number. Um, but it's really going out and getting these young people and encouraging them to come to sessions. So right. it's far difficult because if you're at a school, they're there. Yeah. And you do your session and that's it. But with out of school, you have to go and find them. Yeah. All right, and lastly, you have a video competition that's currently open? Yeah, we open. have a video competition that's uh, on our Facebook page as well. It's about a 40 to 60 second competition that uh, we want to encourage only students from the Kaya district to participate in. They can, we only have a, even though we only have two prizes, it's, uh, it's a start to mm -hmm. get to know what young people are thinking and what, <coughs> excuse me, and what they, they, they seem to have as, to, as solutions to teenage pregnancy. So there's just two requirements. Um, the first one is how teen pregnancy affects young people, so how, how it affects you as a young person. And secondly, um, to give us one, uh, one solution that would realistically decrease teen pregnancy. All right, what's so the deadline? Easy. The deadline is the 15th, the 10th of February, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Okay. All the 10th right. of February. Excellent. Well, we hope uh, and people can check out your Facebook page. Yes, we can. They uh, can definitely follow us. It's Let's Do It Right, please. Yes. Okay. Let's well, thank you right all for joining us thank and uh, for talking about this very important issue. And we hope that you have more people signing up for the program and reaching out to you for uh, the right information. Yeah.
All right. Thank We're you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, it's to be joined by Belizean artist Ras Indio. Stay tuned. <laughs> 